Australia's military history is more than just a collection of dates and the locations of war-ravaged battlefields. It is the stories of service and sacrifice of those who have answered the call of their country of birth or adoption and the enduring legacy they have created. Join me as we look into one of those stories. I'm your host, Ross Manuel, and welcome to I Was Only Doing My Job, Australia's Military History, a Doc Network podcast. Now let's get started. G'day friends and welcome to episode 53 of the podcast and the conclusion of our involvement in History Talks Shipwreck Summer. I have to say it has been interesting doing a series of episodes that were unintentionally connected, which was a surprise to me when I wrote them. But what do you think? Shall this be a thing I routinely do on the podcast? Let me know in the comments. To bring us to the end of Shipwreck Summer, I give you not one, but two wrecks, separated by roughly 13,353 kilometers, but are intrinsically linked by history. They are, of course, the fates of His Majesty's Australian submarines AE-1 and AE-2. Now, the plan was originally to have both wrecks featured in the one episode, but the more I worked on the script, the more I realized that it wasn't right to their respective legacies. This episode will be about AE-1. Next episode will be about AE-2. But before we start, I do have some announcements. When I started writing this episode, the podcast had reached the 10,000 play milestone. And as I sat down to record it, I actually discovered that in the three or so weeks since I started, the podcast has now surpassed the 11,000 play milestone. So for that, I thank you all for the ongoing support. Also, for the first time, the United States is now the podcast's largest listener country, with 53% of the listener base located there, and Ashburn, Virginia being the most listened to location. So if you are from Ashburn, drop the podcast an email and let us know how you're going. Another thing that I'm pleased to announce is that I Was Only Doing My Job, an Australian military history podcast, is now on Patreon. This will serve as another way for people to support the podcast should they wish to, but the, just remember, the podcast will always be free. One of the reasons for the delay in putting out this episode was the availability of sources. There was only one that I had to actually source and purchase myself, and I had to wait for it to be physically delivered. But in that time, I did sit down with Melissa Ratliff of God's Favorites History Podcast and Ryan Day of History Daddy on YouTube to do a roundtable discussion on our favorite shipwrecks. Now, while we did have some technical difficulties with the initial recording, that should be out shortly. And speaking of collaborations, I will be sitting down with the boys over at the Totally Tanked podcast for collaboration in the coming months. The Totally Tanked podcast is another Canberra-based military podcast and definitely worth listening, especially considering today is International Podcasters Day. So let us drop anchor and dive into the deep for the conclusion of our involvement in History Talks Shipwreck Summer with a man who ended history for a very unique reason, the master of HMAS AE-1, Lieutenant Commander Thomas Fleming Besant. Thomas Fleming Besant was born on the 22nd of December 1883 in Liverpool, Lancashire, England. He was the first son and second child of five to Edgar Besant, the storekeeper at Her Majesty's Dockyard Portsea, and his wife Margaret. Brought up a Freemason, Besant had an interest in horses, fishing and golf, and grew up in modest surroundings. He joined the Britannia Naval College, otherwise known as Dartmouth, on the 18th of September 1898 at the age of 15, as was the custom at the time, and would have been billeted aboard the 76.8 metre long X first rate three decker line of battleship HMS Britannia, which was serving as a hulk and cadet training ship moored on the River Dart, hence the name Dartmouth. After completing initial training, he was posted to HMS Vivid, an iron screw yacht that served as the flagship of the Devonport Naval Base at Plymouth, as well as serving as the base's depot ship. He would then be posted to the protected cruiser HMS Endymion for service in the Boxer Rebellion. A protected cruiser is an older term for a cruiser with an armoured deck designed to protect machine spaces from shrapnel from shells exploding above them. The Boxer Rebellion, something I've covered in Episode 2, The Serving King of the AIF, John Barney Hines, Episode 17, A Lifetime at Sea, The Story of Commander Warwick Seymour Bracegirdle, and Episode 37, The Ballad of the Horsehold Cavalry, The Life of Andrew Barton, Banjo Patterson. But for new listeners, the Boxer Rebellion was a local uprising in 1899 against the foreign control of Chinese industry and trade, orchestrated by peasants before being supported by the government. It was headed by a secret society known in English as the Boxers. The Boxer Rebellion, otherwise known as the Boxer Uprising and the Yang Tian Movement, was an anti-foreign, anti-colonial and anti-Christian uprising occurring in China between 1899 and 1901, and was in response to harsh restrictions placed upon the Chinese people following the Second Opium Wars. British forces would join a coalition of other Western Imperial powers, Russia, France, Italy, Austria-Hungary, Germany and the United States, 
along with allied Asian powers, Japan and allied Chinese governors, to essentially protect their interests in the region. While on board in Dimian, Bassat would receive his midshipman certification. On the 27th of June 1902, midshipman Bassant was assigned to the newly arrived HMS Amphrotite, which had arrived in the China station and would stay with the ship until the 25th of March 1903, when he joined the crew of the pre-dreadnought battleship HMS Glory, before returning to England via Portsmouth, to where he was posted to HMS Duke of Wellington. There he attended the Royal Naval College on the 15th of May 1903. While there, he underwent additional training for his lieutenant's course. Bassant did incredibly well academically, receiving first-class passes for seamanship and torpedoes, second-class passes in pilotage, and third-class pass in navigation and gunnery. On graduation, Bassant held appointments on several destroyers for the duration of 1904, before finally posting to the pre-dreadnought battleship HMS Russell. For those curious, a pre-dreadnought is a modern term applied to battleships built before 1906 and the launch of HMS Dreadnought. With Dreadnought's launch, whose primary armament was five turrets of twin 12-inch guns, it immediately rendered all other capital ships that came before her immediately obsolete. And, using Russell as the example, Russell was armed with four 12-inch guns compared to Dreadnought's 10, and also Russell had 10 3-inch guns, while Dreadnought possessed 27 as its secondary armament. Now, while Russell also possessed 12 6-inch guns and, and 6 1.9-inch guns, Dreadnought could unleash her full arsenal at the beginning of an engagement instead of having to wait for the rest of the guns to come to range. This kind of advantage changed the face of naval warfare. At this point, Bassant showed interest in the new military technologies of submarines and hydro airplanes when he posted to the submarine depot ship HMS Thames for, quote, training in submarines, unquote, on the 10th of January, 1905. At the end of that year, he would also be promoted to lieutenant in the 1905 King's New Year's Honours List. It should be noted that the so-called silent service, otherwise known as, quote, the trade, unquote, is thanks in part to the disparaging comment made by the First Sea Lord, Sir Arthur Wilson, VC, GCB, OM, GCVO, in 1910 that, quote, Submariners are nothing more than tradesmen, and submarines are underhanded, unfair, and damned un-English. All submariners captured should be treated as pirates and hanged, unquote. Now, this naturally didn't go down well with the submariners, but to this day, they still call their work the trade, and more than one submarine has flown the Jolly Roger while on deployment. From a technical standpoint, submarines have at least theoretically existed on paper since the 1600s, but the first serviceable submarines for military purposes were developed in the late 19th century. Now, the first alleged use of a submarine during warfare was during the American Revolutionary War with use of the hand-cranked turtle in 1776. But the first of what would be considered a modern submarine didn't see action until the USS Alligator and the CSS HL Hunley in 1861 and 1864 respectively during the US Civil War. While the Royal Navy was slow to adopt this new technology, one that would prove deadly at only a decade later, the Royal Navy would actually in 1914 end up possessing the largest submarine fleet in the world with 74 boats. And yes, they're called boats, not ships. Despite really only being a generation or two removed from these early designs, something must have attracted Bassant to the submarine service, as he famously quoted that he, the service was, quote, not all beer and skittles, and perhaps it is a harder life than the other branches of the service, but it's the life I've chosen. Oh yes, it's dangerous if you want to look at it like that, but it's got to be done, and every man in the Navy, no matter what branch he's in, has to be prepared to meet the danger when it comes, unquote. Bassant would be posted to the depot ship HMS Bonaventure on the 1st of November 1907 to command the submarine C-12. Submarines, being a relatively new invention, hadn't yet earned a naming convention that regular service vessels had. Instead, they were identified simply by their class letter and the hull number within the class. And due to the rapid advances in technology, while the first British submarines were built off the USS Holland and called the Holland Class, the first British built boats started with the A Class, launched in 1902, which was supplanted by the B-Class in 1904, which in turn was replaced by the C-Class in 1905. This was replaced by the D-Class in 1907 and finally the E-Class in 1912. Though more designs would continue through the course of the First World War, E-Class boats would continue to operate well into 1922, working alongside the L-Class that was supposed to replace them. From 1910 to 1912, Bassant would commence his, quote, big ship time, unquote, and serve aboard the battleships HMS King Edward VII and HMS Hercules. This was before he returned to the silent service to command C-30 via HMS Vulcan in August 1912. 
In June 1913, Bassant was, quote, loaned to the Royal Australian Navy for submarine service for a period of three years and took command of the E-class submarine AE-1. In 1909, Australian representatives attended the Imperial Conference of Defence, where the first Lord of the Admiralty, Sir Reginald McKenna, sparked alarm by claiming that the Royal Navy, who had control of the waves for the previous 100 years, was at risk of losing that control if it didn't build more capital ships, as Germany was allegedly making progress to close the gap between the two navies. This understandably sent shockwaves throughout the empire, and several dominions did offer to throw money at this issue, though Australia was initially hesitant to participate. This is considering they'd only federated eight years before. That was, of course, until the Admiralty informed the Australian government that with the expiration of the Anglo-Japanese alliance in 1915 and rising power on the German colonial forces in the South Pacific, that meant that if tensions returned to war in Europe, the Royal Navy would not be able to protect Australia. This is identical to the issue that preceded the Second World War. Understandably, this tactic worked and Australia agreed to purchase a fleet unit, what we'd now call a battle group built around a battle cruiser, three cruisers, three destroyers, and three submarines. Because the Australian government paid for this fleet within their own budget, this enforced the notion that it was the Australian Navy, even though there was an understanding that in the event of war was that if that did happen, the Australian squadron would revert to tactical control back to the Royal Navy. In peacetime, however, the Australian squadron was responsible for anti-piracy, trade protection and enforcement around Australia. The media lauded the announcement, though the first naval member of the Australian Commonwealth Naval Board, Captain William Rook Creswell, was less impressed with the notion of the submarine, specifically. In 1910, against the advice of Captain Creswell, the fledgling Australian Navy purchased the two submarines from the Vickers Maxim shipyard, and as the Australian Navy, understandably, lacked suitably experienced sailors and officers, the crews of the boats were selected from both the Royal Australian Navy and the Royal Navy. For this duty, Bassant would be promoted to Lieutenant Commander. The last two boats of the first reduction run of the E-Class submarines would be Australian, and would be commissioned into the Royal Australian Navy on the 28th of February 1914 as the simply named AE-1 and AE-2, because they were Australia's first and second E-Class submarines. Now, while there was initial talk of a third submarine, I have not found any record that this submarine was ever built, acquired, or delivered. The Australian boats were slightly smaller than the standard E-Class at 54 metres long, 4.6 metres wide, and displaced 664 tonnes on the surface and 780 tonnes submerged. They were slightly faster underwater than the standard E-Class at 10 knots, but travelled at a modest 15 knots on the surface, especially when compared to the other ships that I've mentioned in this series. For armament, the Australian boats omitted a deck gun that would be the standard on later submarines of the class, However, they did possess four 18-inch torpedo tubes, one forward, one aft, and two broadside, mounted one port, one starboard, and the crew complement was 34 officers and ratings. Bassan took command of AE-1 on the 28th of February 1914, with Lieutenant Stoker, who will be the focus of part two of this episode, taking command of AE-2. Bassan, who had seniority, was appointed as commander of the Australian Submarine Squadron, which is interesting considering that while he had nine years in the service, he only had approximately 10 months experience in command of a signal submarine, let alone a squadron. This implies simply how comparatively new the submarine service still was. Both men and their crews would depart Portsmouth, England on the 7th of March 1914 as the clouds of war started to show on the horizon. They were initially escorted by the mast cruiser HMS Eclipse. Due to the relatively new, top secret experimental nature of the E-Class boats, Eclipse spent a great deal of the transit time from Portsmouth to Malta and then onto the Suez Canal with one or both boats under tow or alongside. This was mainly to repair defects and non-performing machinery. The issues plaguing the new boats ranged from the simple as AE-1 breaking down between Malta and Suez, to the more serious of a blade falling off both of AE-2's two propellers three days after leaving Portsmouth. Eclipse escorted both boats from Malta to Port Said for transit through the Suez Canal, and according to accounts, the conditions on the two boats were in these waters was unbearable, with temperatures exceeding 38 degrees Celsius as they transited the Suez Canal and the Red Sea. To combat this, Lieutenant Stoker ordered the upper hull of AE-2 painted white in the hope of reflecting the sunlight. Making port in Colombo, in what is now Sri Lanka, they were escorted mostly under tow by the town-class light cruiser HMS Yarmouth for the journey to Singapore. When there, they joined HMAS Sydney on the 21st of April, which took them the rest of the journey. On the penultimate leg of their journey, while navigating the difficult Lombok Strait, Sydney nearly collided with AE-1 due to issues with AE-1's rudder, which caused her tow rope to break and become tangled in Sydney's rudder. AE-2 initially avoided the drama, steering clear of both vessels until her own steering jammed, which nearly resulted in Sydney colliding with her. 
After some excellent seamanship from all three vessels, AE-1 and AE-2 finally arrived in Australian waters and they entered Port Darwin on the 5th of March for repairs. The convoy then departed to Cairns and then finally arriving in Sydney on Empire Day on the 24th of May. Arriving to minimal fanfare and no media coverage, especially when compared to the arrival of the service vessels of the Royal Australian Navy the year before. Despite that, when they were moored at Garden Island, AE-1 and AE-2 had made history. Despite being towed for approximately a third of the journey, the two boats had made the longest submarine voyage ever undertaken at that time. Now, the journey from Portsmouth to Sydney is roughly 24,982.73 kilometers or 13,489 nautical miles and will take approximately 37 days or five weeks at the 15 knot maximum speed of the AE-1 and AE-2. But as ships are traditionally not run at their maximum speed due to desires to limit the wear and tear that they would sustain, and plus the myriad of receptions and repairs they participated in on their journey, it actually took both boats and their escorts 12 weeks. This episode was made possible thanks to the generous support from our backers, whose donations go towards paying for distribution and streaming costs, the digitization and procurement of records, as well as everything else that goes into making a podcast. And if you enjoy what we do here at I Was Only Doing My Job and want to support the podcast directly and get some sweet rewards in the process, follow the link in the episode description or visit our website to buy the podcast a coffee, either as a one-off or as an ongoing subscription. At the lowest tiers, you'll get episodes early and ad-free, and at higher tiers, you'll get a mention in the episode and even the ability to suggest future topics. For more information, check the link in the episode description or check out www.thedocnetwork.net. And now, let's get back to the show. Because of that delay, and the fact that it was Empire Day, the boats were able to slip into the harbour more or less unnoticed. But that didn't remain the case though, as the public and the press became enamoured with these two strange looking vessels berthed alongside Australia's fleet base. This was magnified by the fact that the public was banned from accessing the vessels due to their top secret nature. This was compounded also by the fact that Jules Verne's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea had only just been translated into English back in 1873 and had become a popular bestseller within the colonies. Besant, as senior sub-commander, was interviewed by the Sydney Morning Herald about the boats and their journey. And about Besant, the reporter noted that, quote, The submarine stood barely five feet above the waterline, save for the bridge and conning tower rising some ten feet higher, and the only naval officer who has made a submarine his home and loves every bit of her would contend that she's a lady like the liner. There are such men you only have to talk to Lieutenant Commander Besant, who was in charge of AE-1. For a few moments and you'll discover it is nine years since he joined the submarine service and has lived a fair proportion of that time underwater, unquote. While in Sydney, the crews, of which 30 were Australian, enjoyed civic receptions and periods of leave as their boats underwent repairs and refit after their history-making journey. As the officers and ratings enjoyed the beach, reception, sport and fresh air, Archduke Franz Ferdinand of the Austro-Hungarian Empire was assassinated and plunged the world into war. And at that point, both Besant and Stoker were steaming headfirst into history once more as AE1 and AE2 went to war. Now, most people would assume that Australia's first involvement in the First World War was the Gallipoli Campaign on the 25th of April 1915. However, the first involvement of Australia's forces in the Great War was actually much earlier in the conflict and much closer to home. When Britain declared war on Germany, Australia was tasked with destroying the vast and powerful German wireless radio network in the Southwest Pacific and, along with New Zealand, to occupy the scattered German-controlled islands in the area, as Britain had already destroyed any cable lines that ran through British territory. This was intended to deny the use of these assets by the German East Asiatic Squadron. Australia was tasked with occupying German New Guinea and the surrounding islands, which is a territory that bordered Australia's already mandated Papuan territory, while New Zealand was tasked with occupying German Samoa. Interestingly though, the presence of the indefatigable class battlecruiser HMAS Australia in the South Pacific was actually enough for the commander of the German East Asiatic Squadron, Admiral Count Maximilian von Spee, to determine that the South Pacific was not the best place for his cruiser force, and after harassing the British and French territories, made for the Atlantic, and ended up engaging with the British West Indies squadron with disastrous results. But before that, they were a serious threat to Australian and New Zealand shipping. On 10th of August 1914, the Australian Naval and Military Expeditionary Force was raised, and 10 days later, the 1,000-strong force of infantry and 500 naval reservists departed Sydney aboard the HMAT Barama, bound for Rabaul, escorted by HMAS Sydney. 
The rest of the Australian squadron would join the convoy over the coming days, as elements such as HMAS Australia and Melbourne had been tasked with assisting New Zealand forces with the capture of German Samoa. AE-1 and AE-2, along with their depot ship HMAS Upulu, joined the convoy on the way to Port Moresby. On the 11th of September 1914, one of the first Allied offensive operations of the war took place with Australian naval reservists landing ashore at Kabakul to destroy the radio tower located there. The following day, HMAT Barima landed forces at Rabaul. On the 13th of September 1914, the Union Jack was raised over Rabaul and the ANMEF took on garrison duties. The key duties of the two submarines now was to guard St George's Strait lying between New Britain and New Ireland to defend the fleet from approaching enemy ships. From 8am on the 14th of September, AE-1 and the destroyer HMAS Parramatta patrolled near Cape Gazelle in the search of the German East Asiatic Squadron, before the two ships parted company with AE-1 last being seen at 3.30pm. Parramatta returned to AE-1's last reported location to find no trace of her, and presuming that they had returned to port as planned, Parramatta returned to Herberstone, the site of the Australian landings, and dropped anchor at 7pm to find that AE-1 was not there. After an hour, AE-1 had not returned, prompting Rear Admiral George Edwin Patey, the fleet commander, to order a search. The protected cruiser HMAS Encounter, along with the destroyers HMAS Parramatta, Warrigo and Yarra, searched for two days, but no trace of the submarine was found. On the 14th of September 1914, it was determined that HMAS AE-1, Australia's first submarine, was lost with all hands. All 34 officers and ratings of HMAS AE-1 are commemorated in the Plymouth Naval Memorial, and the 17 Australians who served aboard are also commemorated on Panel 1 of the First World War Roll of Honour in the commemorative area at the Australian War Memorial in Canberra. Lieutenant Commander Thomas Fleming Besant was 31 at the time of his death. He was not married, nor did he have any children. A call had been made to convene a board of inquiry to determine what had actually happened to AU-1, but for some unknown reason, it was never held. Instead, Lieutenant Stoker, who was now senior sub-commander, was asked for his expert opinion on what might have happened, as AE-2 had already been sent to Suva on the 4th of October to support a multinational fleet comprised of His Majesty's Australian ships Australia, Sydney Encounter, and Warrigo, and the French light cruiser Montcalm, tasked with hunting down the German service vessels after they had attacked the French territory on the 22nd of September. Stoker listed several possible reasons that might have resulted in the loss of AE-1, including, in increasing possibility, enemy action, breakdown, coming afoul of the myriad of unmapped coral reefs, or catastrophic mechanical failure. While a German armed tug had been spotted in the area and the German government did claim responsibility to her sinking, this claim was almost immediately dismissed by naval authorities. Breakdown or coming afoul of the reef, while possible, was unlikely owing to the lack of debris found, and that being said, it was generally accepted that the still comparatively new technology of the submarines was at least partly to blame. Despite wartime censorship, the public outpour of grief at the loss of AE-1 was widespread, with at least 268 separate articles being posted in September 1914 alone related to the loss of AE-1. Now, most of these would be crew lists and memorial messages. A significant number of these also speculated on what happened to her. These messages also carried the condolences from across the empire, with the commanders-in-chief of the East Indies and China, the New Zealand government, Winston Churchill, who at the time was the First Lord of the Admiralty, as well as a message of sympathy from the King and Queen of England. The Naval Board released a statement saying, quote, Although our men did not fall by the hand of the enemy, they fell on active service and in defence of their empire, and their names will be enshrined with those of heroes, unquote. Sadly, the outpour of grief from the Australian people would be short-lived, as eight months later, her sister ship, AE-2, would be sunk. But that will be the focus of Part 2. In 1968 and the re-establishment of the Australian Submarine Service, the commander of the Australian Submarine Squadron, Commander William Owen, ordered a memorial plaque for AE-1 to be presented to the War Graves Commission to be placed at the Bitter Parker War Cemetery in Rabaul, which is the same cemetery that Thomas Douglas and George Knight are interred, as mentioned in the episode 51, relating to the life, service, and legacy of Chief Yeoman of Signals, Stephen Lamont. Owing to the renewed interest in the silent service, 55 years after her sinking, calls to find AE-1's final resting place gained traction. This is mainly due to the efforts of retired Royal Australian Naval Officer Commander John Foster, who first heard of AE-1 while being posted to Port Moresby when the locals were remarked about seeing a submarine on the ocean floor. He was surprised to find that most of the official files relating to the boat hadn't been opened since 1919, 
and those it had were only open for administrative corrections. In 1976, Foster managed to convince the Navy to retask the survey vessel HMAS Flinders from its hydrographic survey off the waters of the north coast of Australia to conduct a side-scan sonar pass on its journey through the last known location of AE-1. While a promising contact was discovered, the vessel was unable to investigate it. Despite this setback, Foster continued to stay on the search, spurred on by descendants of AE-1's crew. Perhaps motivated by Foster's research, renowned underwater explorer Jacques Cousteau searched for AU-1 while transiting between the provinces of New Britain and New Ireland in 1990. Cousteau's plan was to deploy a submersible from his research ship Calypso and examine the sonar contact detected by HMAS Flinders near the Crendia Islands in 1976. Unfortunately, the submersible was plagued by technical issues and the dive was aborted. Instead, his crew conducted a magnetometer survey of the area but failed to detect any contacts of interest. Not to be perturbed, despite being rejected by the Australian government to conduct any further surveys, Foster engaged documentary companies, television stations and museums to continue searching through the 2000s, conducting four unsuccessful surveys between 2002 and 2007. In 2007, the hydrographic survey ship HMAS Benalla in February that year with Foster aboard detected a possible man-made object in the water within the area suggested by local fishermen. But technical difficulties hampered the search, something that was mirrored when the minesweeper HMAS Yarra attempted to scan the same area later that year. In 2009, two attempts were made to locate AU-1 based on new information, this time eliciting help from the West Australian Maritime Museum and Project Silent Anzac who conversely was the group that located AE-1 sister ship AE-2. While Commander Foster would pass away in 2010, his colleagues picked up the search and continued to look, and in 2012, HMAS Gascoigne and HMNZS Resolution, while participating in a demining operation as part of Operation Render Safe, which is the name for the multinational operation to remove unexploded ordnance from old and forgotten battlefields, conducted another sonar survey of the target area. And while they didn't find AE-1, they did manage to find a missing Japanese midget submarine that had sunk in Simpson Harbour. In September 2014, HMAS Yarra will conduct a second survey for AE-1, but failed to find anything then, 103 years after AE-1 disappeared on the 21st of the December 2017, on the 13th search effort to find her final resting place. It was located off the coast of Duke of York Islands, by a team jointly funded by the Australian Government, the Silent World Foundation, the Australian National Maritime Museum, and Find AE-1 Limited, utilising the Dutch survey company Fugro. Interestingly, Silent World and Fugro would also go on to find the wreck of the Montevideo Maru in 2023. HMAS AE-1, as she's been renamed, was found at a depth of 300 metres or 980 feet upright on the ocean floor. Despite diving below crush depth, the boat is well preserved and in one piece. Investigations conducted by divers at the time determined that the ship imploded, killing the crew instantly, and while the reason will never be truly known, it is now largely accepted that AE-1 sank due to a ventilation valve and the hull being left partially open during a routine dive, which would have flooded the engine room. Now whether this was mechanical or human error, it will never be determined. The Australian government has not revealed the exact location of the wreck to protect it from illegal salvages, something they mentioned in the last episode and is classified as a war grave. Lieutenant Commander Thomas Fleming Besant's legacy continues to this day with the submarine intervention gear ship MV Besant, a submarine search and rescue vessel launched in 2015 along with her sister ship MV Stoker. As I bring part one of the shipwreck summer finale to a close, I'd like to share with you excerpts from two poems that were penned following the loss of AU-1. In an age when poetry was a significant means of conveying information and emotion, these verses provide a glimpse into the collective sentiment at the time. The verse is titled Missing and was written by Will Lawson. Quote, They heard no clamour of battle, no charging squadrons cheers, no murderous maxims rattle that was dinned in their dying ears. For wrapped in the ocean boundless, there were tides were scarcely stirred, in their depths they still and soundless, their perished seen unheard. O oh, brave are the heroes dying, mid thunder of the charge of gun, but our half-mast flags are flying for the crew of AE-1, unquote. The second poem is called To the Men of AE-1, Entombed but Not Forgotten, by Del McKay. Quote, She faced no battle flame, she heard no German gun, the ship without a name, the luckless AE-1, yet were her sailors' lives no less for empire loss, and mothers' sweethearts and wives must pay the bitter cost, unquote. Both of these poems will be reposted in full on the podcast website.
Commander Besant and his 33 brother sailors joined the ranks of the Eternal Patrol, a term used to honour submariners who have perished at sea in the line of duty. While their service and legacy has been overshadowed by events eight months later in the Dardanelles, it is my hope that his story will live on and that the sacrifice of AE-1 will never be forgotten. For their service, we are all eternally grateful. And there we have it, friends. That is the end of part one of the finale to our contribution to History Talk's Shipwreck Summer. Catch you next time for the final episode and the life, service, and legacy of Lieutenant Commander Henry Hugh Gordon Dacry Stoker and the Silent Anzac AE-2. Citations used in this episode are Finding the Lost Submarine, The Mystery of AE-1 by Graham Seal and Centenary of the Silent Service by Graham Seal and Lloyd Blake. Strange Submarines, Volume 2 by Michael White. The Trove Newspaper Archive at the National Library of Australia. The Australian National Submarine Museum. The website, the Australian E-Class Submarines. The 25th of March, 1983 edition of the Royal Australian Navy News. The Masonic Great War Project. The service record of Lieutenant and Lieutenant Commander Thomas Fleming Besant at the National Archives of Australia and the National Archives of the United Kingdom. The Australian Naval and Military Expeditionary Force at the New South Wales Anzac Centenary Project by the New South Wales State Archives. What Happened to HMAS AE-1 by Peter Briggs from the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. The Royal Australian Navy Articles on HMAS AE-1 and MB Besant. The Dreadnought Project. The Thomas Fleming Besant Archives at Second Line of Defence. The History of Submarines from Science to Self from the Collector website. And the website of the Australian War Memorial. In particular, it's encyclopedia entries on AE-1 and Thomas Fleming Besant. The entry, the AE-1 and AE-2 submarines, Australia's first submarines. The press release on the discovery of AE-1 and the article, The Mystery of the AE-1, written by Claire Hunter. Thanks for listening to the I Was Only Doing My Job Australia's Military History Podcast, a Doc Network production. This episode was recorded on the lands of the Gangdangara people whose elders have passed on knowledge for thousands of years, and we pay our respects to elders past, present, and emerging. This episode was written, researched, produced, directed, and audio engineered by me, Ross, with additional research done by Laurie Favell of My Silent Hero. If you do know someone whose story needs to be told, feel free to leave a comment on an episode or send us an email at IWasOnlyDoingMyJobPod at gmail.com. If you like what we do here and you want to support this podcast, the best thing you can do is share this with a friend or leave a review on your favorite podcast platform as it really helps others find the show. And if you want to join in on the conversation, join us over on Discord. And if you want more content, including show notes, photos, transcripts, and my various adventures finding memorials dotted around Australia, head over to our website at www.thedocnetwork.net and follow the show on all our social media pages at IWODMJ. Don't worry, there are links to everything in the show notes. Join me personally for more bite-sized history over on TikTok and pretty much everywhere else at Doc Winters. All opinions expressed in this episode are solely those of the speaker and do not reflect the views or opinions of any entity, agency, or organization. It is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 4.0 International License. Thanks for listening. Catch you next time. Bye.